Can you all hear me? Okay, good. All right, I have one minute, and I'm glad to see that every single seat is full. It's great. Okay, at 6.30, I'm about to start. Okay. My, good evening, my name is Suzanne Wassman. I'm the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History here at the CUNY Graduate Center. Please join us next Thursday, May 7th, for our, our last spring 2015 forum downstairs in the recital hall for a talk by Peter Laskowicz on Jackie Robinson's Brooklyn. Since he first stepped onto the field in 1947, breaking the color line, Jackie Robinson has been a mythical figure. Enduring the rough transition of being the first black man to play in the major leagues and tear down the wall of segregation, Robinson did more than just entertain crowds with his athletic prowess. He changed the nation. Join Peter Lashkowitz for a discussion of the icon's life and his impact on the United States, Brooklyn, and baseball. Tonight, please help me welcome Doug Most. <laughs> Doug Most is the author of The Race Underground. Boston, New York, and the incredible rivalry that built America's first subway. Doug Most is a veteran journalist and deputy managing editor at the Boston Globe. He has worked for newspapers in Washington, D.C., South Carolina, and New Jersey covering transportation and aviation issues, and he's written for Sports Illustrated, Parents Magazine, and Runner's World. His stories have appeared in Best American Sports Writing and Best American Crime Writing. The Race Underground tells the story of how mankind had to overcome centuries of fear of the underground before embarking on the construction of subway tunnels. The book also explores the fascinating characters, engineering challenges, political hurdles, and financial mountains that had to be scaled in order to complete the mega projects. Key characters in the book include William Barclay Parsons, the founder of Parsons Brickenhoff, Brickerhoff, and designer of the New York subway, William Steinway, the great piano manufacturer who steered the New York Transit Commission, Henry and William Whitney, two brothers from a great American family who were instrumental in the birth of the Boston and New York subways, and Alfred Beach and Boss Tweed, whose feud over a secret subway is an epic David and Goliath tale. The Race Underground received wide praise from The Economist, The New York Times, Atlantic, and it was chosen by The Week as one of the 18 books to read in 2014. Without further ado, Doug Most. Thank you, Suzanne, for that uh, lovely welcome, and thank you for coming tonight on a beautiful evening. We've got the blue sky, and, uh, and it's not nine degrees out, like I feel like we had for the last seven months. Or, um, so, uh, so I thought what I would do tonight is a couple things. I'm going to tell you a few stories. Sure. How's that? Better? Uh, so I thought what I would do tonight is tell you a few stories. Um, this book uh, was, um, it's a cliche, but I'll say it anyway, it was a labor of love. Uh, I'd never sort of embarked on a project like this before I wrote a book uh, 12 years ago when I was a reporter in New Jersey about a crime and it was sort of a very different type of book. Um, this was something that was born out of uh, sort of a desire to find a great story about American history. Um, and there are so many out there. And the initial idea for the book, to be honest with you, was to tell the story just of the Boston subway. Um, the Boston subway, affectionately known as the T, um, is America's first subway. Um, and no one had ever really told the story of the Boston subway. Um, I lived in New York years ago, lived in the Upper West Side. I grew up in New England. Uh, I have parents who are from the Bronx, so I'm sort of, my allegiances are split. Um, but uh, the Boston subway always fascinated me. Uh, it's sort of this, sort of a, a quirky thing if you've ever ridden on it. Some people don't even like to call it a subway. They say it's really just a trolley underground. Um, which is true to a certain degree, but a trolley underground, by definition, is a subway. Um, so the Boston subway was the beginning of this book, but as I got into the reporting and the research and uh, sort of started to look at the people and the events and the time period, I was struck by something, which is, I was struck by two things, first of all. The first thing I was struck by is that at the same time 
Boston was going through its debate about whether to build the subway, how to build the subway, where to build the subway, and all those things in the 1880s and the 1890s. New York City was going through the exact same debate. It's happening at the same time. And I was sort of struck by that. So as I looked into it, I thought, well, that's interesting. You have these two cities, which of course have this great relationship, and, and some people like to refer to it as a rivalry, but it's really not a rivalry unless you are fascinated just with the Yankees and the Red Sox, but that's a whole other story. Um, it's, uh, those, the two cities really have a, a unique relationship together. They're close uh, geographically, um, and so as I started looking at it, I realized that the book really is not just about Boston. It's really about Boston and New York in the 1880s and the 1890s, and all the amazing things that were happening back then. That was the first thing I discovered as I started looking into the research. The second thing I discovered was that there was a key player in the Boston story who really was going to be almost the, the central figure to the entire book. His name was Henry Melville Whitney. Henry Melville Whitney was a, uh, born in 1839 in uh, Conway, Massachusetts, and he was sort of a slacker. He struggled in school, dropped out of school, didn't really know what he wanted to do with his life until he rose up as a powerful businessman in Boston in the 1880s and into the 1890s and did some very big things in Boston. Well, Henry Whitney had a brother, two years younger than him, born in 1841. His name was William Whitney, William Collins Whitney. So the Whitney name, obviously for anyone in this room, probably has a lot of a historical resonance for you. So two things for me came to mind when I thought of just the name Whitney. First was maybe back to fifth grade, Eli Whitney, right? We all remember Eli Whitney, the inventor of the cotton gin. So Eli Whitney was indeed a cousin of this Whitney clan. So that's number one. But then of course, if you're in New York, something else comes to mind, which is the Whitney Museum of Art. And indeed, William Collins Whitney, he married into the Vanderbilt family, or his, I should say one of his children married into the Vanderbilt family. And of course the Vanderbilt family was responsible for the creation of the Whitney Museum back in the early 1900s. So William Whitney left a deep legacy on this city and on this country. In fact, William Whitney could have been the president of the United States if he wanted to. In 1896, William Whitney uh, was a powerful democratic politician and there were buttons, people were walking around in Chicago at the convention there saying Whitney for president. And he could have been the president, but he didn't want that. So instead, he got involved in the transit system of New York. And as I got into the research of this family, Henry Whitney and William Whitney became two central characters for me. One of them lived in Boston, one of them lived in New York. Both of them got deeply immersed and involved in the transportation systems and the transit systems of their respective cities. So there, there was the making for me of a great story. I have Boston, I have New York, I have transportation and transit and subways and overcrowded cities, and I have a great American family, the Whitney family, two brothers, one in Boston, one in New York, both involved in their transportation systems of their cities. That sort of is how the book got started. So there are a couple of stories I thought I would tell you from the book. Um, the book took me about five years to write, uh, to report and write, I should say. Um, and I probably left a whole other book on the cutting room floor. Uh, so much of it had to get left out. But the things that I included in there were the things that I sort of found to be most fascinating or essential to the, the theme of the story. So I'm gonna tell you a couple of those stories. The first one is about a skinny little opera-loving inventor who was born in 1826 in Springfield, Massachusetts. His name was Alfred Eli Beach. Alfred Eli Beach was, in my mind, one of the great characters in this story. And he's really an unsung sort of hero in a lot of ways in New York City history. So Alfred Eli Beach was a tinkerer, loved to play with his hands. Anything he could get his hands on, he was just tinkering with it constantly. He also took ownership of a little magazine early in his life, in his 20s, called um, Scientific American. And Scientific American at the time was sort of a tiny little publication that had a very quirky audience, just of, of sort of scientists and engineers and people who read it. It was very small circulation. But Alfred Beach was smart. He recognized that those engineers and those inventors and all those hundreds of people who were reading Scientific American at the time had a desire to do bigger things. They were inventors. They were like him, a tinkerers, people who loved to make things, create things, invent things. He figured out that if I could just get the list of patents that's published from the US Patent Office, 
in Washington, D.C., and publish that list in my little magazine, then my magazine has a bigger purpose. Then all these inventors and engineers and tinkerers are going to want this magazine because they're going to want to see what patent's been filed and is it competing with some project that they're working on and all those things. So he did that. He got that list and he started publishing this long list in his Scientific American of patents that were being approved. No surprise, the circulation of Scientific American exploded. Went from just having a few thousand readers to 10,000 readers to 100,000 readers. Took off. That sort of helped Alfred Beach become a player, if you want to think of it that way. In 1849, Alfred Beach published a story in Scientific American in which he wrote of a dream of his. And that dream was to tunnel under Broadway. Those words had never been uttered before. There was no subway anywhere in the world in 1849. Anybody know which city opened the world's first subway? London. London. 1863. London opened the world's first subway in 1863. So in 1849, the idea of a subway was nothing more than a dream. London, in 1849, a couple years before then, had built a pedestrian tunnel. In 1841, London opened a pedestrian tunnel under the Thames River. That pedestrian tunnel, on the day it opened, to give you an idea of what life was like back then for people, on the day it opened in 1841, thousands, it was a big celebration, as you can imagine, big tunnel underground for pedestrians. Thousands of people walked over to the tunnel entrance, walked down a steep staircase, took one look down the tunnel, and turned right around and went back up. They were not ready for that. We tend to take for granted today the idea of underground travel and going underground. We walk down into the subway staring at our phones and our tablets and our Kindles and our newspapers. Hopefully our newspapers is someone at the Boston Globe. Um, we tend to take for granted the idea of traveling and going underground. Back then, 100, 150 years ago, going underground was terrifying for people. It really was. People were afraid of the underground. That was where demons lived. That's where the devil lived. That's where vermin lived. That was not where you went to travel. So Alfred Beach in 1849 publishes this article and says, we're going to tunnel under Broadway. The reaction was laughter, mockery. Go back to where you came from. What are you, crazy? Tunnel under Broadway? Who would, who would do that? Who would ride there? Who would go there? Forget about it. So he did. But he didn't completely forget about it. In 1867, almost 20 years later, at the American Institute Fair in New York City, he unveiled a little contraption he had built. It ran along the ceiling. It was a little car, and it rode along the ceiling. It was blown by a fan. That's how it moved. A big fan blew this car down this track that he had built, and you could get into it. It was small, but you could get into it. Ten people could sit in this little car. It would blow it down the track, and then the fan would be reversed, and it would suck the car back. <laughs> that was it. At the American Institute Fair, he unveiled this thing. And you know what? People loved it. They were fascinated by it. That little contraption became sort of the talk of the fair. And Alfred Beach emerged from that and said, we're going to build this tunnel under Broadway. We're going to do it. I am going to do it. So he set out to do that, except there was one problem. That problem was a 300-pound state crime boss by the name of William Boss Tweed. Boss Tweed was taking a cut out of every bus fare in the city at the time, a nickel. He was making a fortune, needless to say. And Boss Tweed was not going to let some skinny little opera-loving inventor come in and build a subway and take away his <coughs> illegal fortune that he was making. So Boss Tweed stood in the way and wouldn't let Beach do anything he wanted to. So Alfred Beach had to get creative. So what he did is he went before the state legislature and he said, I just want to build a tunnel under the city for carrying mail. London had a tunnel under the city for carrying mail and it worked and it was blown by a fan and this pneumatic tube sort of idea. I, mean, I just want to build a, a tunnel under the city to help mail carriers move mail faster through the city. Boss Tweed looked at that idea and the legislature looked at that idea and said, well, that's a pretty good idea. Sure, go ahead and build your little mail tunnel. So he got his approval from the legislature. A couple months later, he went back to the state legislature. And he said, you know, before I said I wanted to build just two small tunnels. But actually, what I'd like to do is build one bigger tunnel. At this time, Boss Tweed had sort of gotten distracted by some other things. He wasn't really paying that close attention. 
and Alfred Beach's sort of just tweak to his proposal sort of went unnoticed by Boss Tweed. But the legislature said, sure, you can build one tunnel, two tunnels, whatever you want, fine, carrying mail, go ahead, build. That little change was a big deal. Alfred Beach rented a space underneath Devlin's department store in the Murray Hill neighborhood. And in the dark of night, in 1869, Alfred Beach and an, a small army of workers would go down there in the basement of this department store and start chipping away. They would chip, chip, chip with picks and axes and shovels and a, a little tunneling shield that Alfred Beach had even built because he was an inventor, remember. And he built this tunneling shield and they carved away this tunnel under the city, unbeknownst to everybody up above. Nobody knew what was going on. They thought he was building a little mail tunnel, but he was building something much more ambitious. At one point, Broadway started to collapse. The road up above started to buckle. And the mayor's office got a little concerned. What are you doing over there, they asked him. And he said, don't worry, don't worry, everything's fine. Just working on my pneumatic mail tunnel over here. The mayor's office said, well, well I got to send someone over there to look at your project. And Beach's people stood firm and said, no, 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 not until we're done. And he refused to let anybody come into his tunnel. So no one got in. Took him about six months, but they dug 312 feet, essentially the length of one block. That's about what they built. This tunnel was remarkably efficient. It was sealed. It was grouted, essentially. It was waterproof and watertight. It was uh, white and bright. Everything about it was an amazing feat. So then he needed one last piece of equipment. Well, really two. He had built and designed a car like the one he had shown at the fair, but it was bigger. This one could hold 22 people. It was like a cylinder, and it rode on these tracks that he had laid down with his workers. That was the first piece of equipment. But the second piece of equipment he needed was a fan, a really, really big fan. The fan he brought in came from Indiana. It was called the Western Tornado. Brought it in on a train, brought it to the corner there, right in Murray Hill, and it was like a giant monster just swallowed it up. One day it was there, the next day it was gone, underground. That fan would blow his car down the tracks, and you'd reverse it, and it would suck the car right back. So this whole project happens in complete secrecy. Nobody knows it's happening, certainly not Boss Tweed. So in 1869, late 1869, a reporter for the New York Times actually sneaks in. There had been talk about what Beach was doing, but no one really knew. A reporter snuck into the project, saw what was happening, and wrote a story about it. An essentially praising story. It wasn't a critical story. It was saying that Beach has done it. He's built a tunnel. And I, this is the future. There's going to be a subway tunnel under Broadway. That story sort of exposed Beach's secret. Very quickly, he had to decide what to do. So he immediately, within a week, invited the public and public officials to come in and see what he had built. And what he had built was pretty amazing. He would built a station, unlike any of the stations that we travel through today. This one had a goldfish tank, a piano, a chandelier, couches for women to sit on. It was sort of a living room underground, a very beautiful living room. This is what he had created, because he wanted people to feel comfortable underground. He knew there was fear of the underground, that there was going to have to be a lot of obstacles overcome to convince people to go down there. So he wanted them to walk down these stairs and be comfortable there. One person, needless to say, was not too happy about what Beach had done. But Beach's invention sort of really worked remarkably. All these people, thousands of people, were invited to come down into this tunnel and to ride on this magical car that was blown down the tracks and sucked back. When the fan was turned on, men who were wearing hats walking over the grate on the street would have their hat blown off their head because the fan was so powerful. But it worked. Now, there was one problem, needless to say, this idea of a pneumatic tube. Maybe it worked for 312 feet, but would it have worked for an entire network of subway cars? It's hard to wonder, hard to imagine. Boss Tweed was not happy, and he really now got angry with, with Alfred Beach. And the two of them sort of went to war over whether he would ever get to complete his subway project. Boss Tweed was dirty, fought dirty. Alfred Beach sort of didn't know how to fight that way, and he was not a rich man either. He had borrowed a lot of his own money to build this project. 
There was a financial catastrophe. Black Friday happened that sort of bankrupted Alfred Beach and took a lot of his money. Boss Tweed got arrested, sent to jail. A lot of things happened. And Alfred Beach never got to really see his dream through to the end. Late in the 1890s, there was a story that I read that I thought was fascinating that said there was often a solitary figure who could be seen in this abandoned tunnel down there, sitting in a milk crate with white hair and just sort of staring off into the distance. Beach sort of never got to finish his dream and see his dream through to the end. His tunnel was sort of closed down, converted into a shooting gallery briefly, into a wine cellar, but it never got built to anything more than what he did. Years later, I often get asked this question, so I'm sort of going to preempt anyone wants to ask it. People say, well, what happened to the tunnel? So in 1912, workers who were actually digging the real New York subway broke through a wall and stumbled onto history. They stumbled onto Alfred Beach's subway car that was still down there and intact. Rotted, the wood was rotted and other things. It wasn't, you know, in great shape, but it was there. And it was right in the path of the route that they were, building, they were um, digging. They had to make a decision. What do we do? And sadly, they just dug right through and destroyed it, didn't preserve it. I'm sure the New York Transit Museum is probably sad about that. Probably wish they'd love to have that car today. Talk about a piece of history. So it wasn't preserved, it wasn't saved, and the subway route essentially went right through there. So that's one of my favorite stories in the book because it really is this David and Goliath tale. The story of Alfred Beach and Boss Tweed sort of going to war for the future of New York City streets. You have to remember back then, people got around on horse-pulled carriages. The, New York, the uh, London subway was built in 1863. The next subway would not open for another 30 years. I remember when I learned that, I was surprised, because you would think, I mean, the London subway worked. It was effective, the underground. It took millions of people off the streets, and it really worked, except for one horrible flaw. So for 30 years, no other city built a subway. And I sort of wondered, well, why is that? You would think when one city builds something that really is effective, other cities would follow suit and do the same thing. Why isn't New York and Paris and all these great cities, why aren't they all building subways right away? Anybody know the answer? Yeah, so in 1863, trains back then, there was only one kind of train. It was a coal-powered steam train. So the trains that were going through the London Underground in 1863, were spewing into the air dark soot, smoke, and sparks into the air. It was a miserable, miserable experience. People would ride on these trains and they would sort of say it was like sitting next to someone blowing cigar smoke in your face for the entire ride. It was horrible, but it worked and it was effective. So that's what they had. But it would take another inventor and another great person to come along and change that. So my book is called The Race Underground. There was another race that happened in the 1880s which I talk about in the book, but I ended up having to cut a big chunk of it because I just ran out of room. But it's a great story. And it's the story about the race to build the first electric motor. There would not be subways today if these people had not achieved this and built this electric motor. Because that really is what allowed subways to become better than the London Underground. So London Underground was not effective. One of the people who went and rode on the London Underground in the 1880s was a guy by the name of Frank Julian Sprague. So he's another sort of key, key character in the book. Frank Julian Sprague was born in Connecticut, 1857. He was a Navy midshipman, and he was brilliant, brilliant engineer. In the 1880s, his boat, he's on the Navy, his boat docks in London, and he goes to judge at a, an electrical fair in London. And while he's at this fair in London in uh, 1883, he bumps into a gentleman, he meets a gentleman there by the name of E.E. E. Johnson. E.E. E. Johnson worked for a man back in the United States by the name of Thomas Edison. So E.E. E. Johnson meets Frank Sprague and is sort of taken by him. He's this young, charismatic, engineer, smart, energetic, exciting. E.E. E. Johnson writes back to Thomas Edison in the States and says, I've met someone that you need to hire. You need to hire Frank Sprague. You two could do great things together. Edison's busy. He's working on his perfecting his light bulb, which is already invented, but he's working on it, making it better. He's working on a phonograph and lots of things. He's busy. He doesn't get back to E.E. E. Johnson right away. E.E. E. Johnson 
is nervous. He wants Edison to hire Sprague. And he writes him again, repeatedly. Hire him, get him, bring him on board. Finally, Edison writes back and says, fine, fine, fine. And he writes to Sprague, and he invites him to come to Menlo Park, New Jersey. Join him there, work with him. Sprague is, of course, thrilled at the opportunity. Edison is a hero of his, someone he idolizes. The opportunity to come work with him would be exciting. Sprague has been sort of tinkering himself with an electric motor. And he sort of becomes fascinated with the idea. He really wants to build an electric motor. He sees the London Underground and says, I can do better than this. We can do, be we can do better than this. So he goes back to the States. He gets off his boat, actually. Um, a little side note here. One of the reporting techniques I used uh, in writing this book was I created a huge timeline, basically an Excel spreadsheet, a giant, giant timeline. Every time I came across a date, any date, no matter what it was, I entered it into the timeline. And what that allowed me to do was sort of an interesting technique. It allowed me to notice when events converged and collided that I never would have noticed because in two years of research, you know, I might be researching something one day and then something else entirely six months later, but their dates will overlap, but I will never notice that unless I really am paying attention. So that's how this came to light for me. So I noticed that when I entered this date into my spreadsheet on the date that Frank Sprague got off his boat in New York City to go work with Thomas Edison in Menlo Park, New Jersey. It was May 23rd, 1884. Anybody have any ideas what else was on my spreadsheet on that day? The opening of the Brooklyn Bridge. Frank Sprague gets off his boat and there's a parade of people walking down toward the harbor. He's like, what's going on? He doesn't even know, but you know what, he didn't care. He sort of was so focused on going to join Edison, he just ignores the parade of people, gets on his train and goes down to Menlo Park, New Jersey. But that little thing sort of came up in my spreadsheet that I created, these two dates on the exact same date. Guy gets off a boat and the open of the Brooklyn Bridge. I'm like, well, that's sort of neat. So Sprague goes to join Edison in New Jersey. And it's one of those times in history where you wonder what might have happened if this had played out differently. If this, had, if this relationship between these two great, brilliant engineering minds had played out differently, you wonder what might have happened. Unfortunately, what happened is that Sprague went to join Edison and he wanted to work on his motor. That's what he was really focused on. He wanted to perfect this electric motor. Edison wanted him to work on his projects. He hired him, he wanted him to work on his projects. So the two of them worked together for about a year. But in the end, Sprague got tired and he wrote a letter to Edison. I remember going down to the New York Public Library, and I was able to hold this letter in my hand. It was sort of thrilling for me as a researcher and a reporter. And in this letter, he said that I want to achieve the same fame with the electric motor that you achieved with the light bulb. That's how important it was to him. And he said that I no longer want to work for you or can work for you, and I want to strike out on my own. Edison wrote back a very short note and said, I accept your resignation. And that was only after one year of working together. Sort of sad, you wonder, like I said, what would have happened if these guys had managed to spend a decade together, what might have been. But it wasn't to be. Frank, Frank Sprague goes off on his own, and he does what he said he was going to do. He perfects the electric motor. And in 1888, Frank Sprague gets this motor to where it really works. He's put it on some flat cars, and it works, and it moves down the train tracks, and he's sort of got it to where it really works. Now what he needs is he needs a city that's willing to take a chance on him. It's willing to sort of let him take his motor and put it onto their trains, their trolleys, and see if it can really power a system. Richmond, Virginia raises its hand. Richmond, Virginia at the time is a small city in the south, and they're looking to electrify their trolley tracks. This is something that's starting to happen now around the country. The horse, the weaknesses and the flaws of the horse-pulled carriages is really sort of being seen and noticed by a lot of cities. There have been storms and other things that are sort of really making the horse a problem. There's another problem with the horse as well. Horses required a lot of attention. A good horse would last maybe two or three years pulling carriages. They, kept, they were kept in these big stables in urban areas filled with hay. And hay in a big city was not a really good thing. All it took was one match or one spark, and that stable could just go up in flames. It happened in New York City. Huge fire in the 1880s, uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, essentially just destroyed and leveled an entire city block. 
because of a fire at a stable. So the horse was flawed in a lot of ways. And Frank Sprague comes along and he gets Richmond, Virginia to agree to allow him to come down there with his motor and to put it on their trolley system. So he goes down there and they offer him a contract and they say, here's the deal, Mr. Sprague. You need to build us 90 motors, 90. We will pay you, we will pay you not a single penny until you complete those motors. Get them onto our trolleys and get the system running. And then we will pay you your money. Would you sign that contract? But Frank Sprague was desperate, right? He wanted that fame and he knew the only way it was gonna happen was if he worked on this project and got a city to sort of see what he could do. So he signed that contract. He was given nine months to build 90 motors. And keep in mind at this point, he basically had one motor. One motor that he had worked on for five years and perfected, but that was it. Now he had to go build 90 of them. He signed that contract and almost immediately he was struck down with typhoid fever. <laughs> Laid flat on his back for three months. Fortunately, he had hired a group of men and they worked for him and they got his motors and they built them. He got back on his feet and he set to work and he got that system up and running. And Richmond, Virginia became the first city to have a paid electric trolley system. Small, not a big system, but it worked. Those trolleys worked. But it was Richmond, right? It was Richmond. It was not a big city. It was not going to give Frank Sprague what he so cherished and wanted fame. What he needed was a buyer and a player in a big city. That brings me back to the Whitney family. Henry Whitney up in Boston. He was this slacker, this sort of struggler in school, couldn't figure out what he wanted to do with his life. In the 1880s, mid 1880s, Henry Whitney, he may not have been book smart, but he was street smart. And one thing he did was he started buying up real estate outside of Boston, just in the outskirts, in this little town called Brookline. Brookline is a wealthy sort of community, and he recognized that what was gonna happen in Brookline, same thing that was happening in New York City, was that those horse-pulled carriages, they needed to expand. They needed to go further out into the suburbs or into the Upper West Side or into Brookline and other neighborhoods. They needed to push out. Everybody was so crammed into a fingerprint of these cities that people needed more room. As immigrants were streaming into the cities by the thousands every day, getting off these boats, the cities needed to grow. And the only way that was going to happen was if there was transportation to take them further out from the downtown area. So Henry Whitney started buying all this real estate in Brookline, Massachusetts, right along a street called Beacon Street. It's a famous road in Brookline. And sure enough, what happened in 1887, all these uh, transit companies that ran the trolleys in Boston, there were seven different streetcar companies in Boston, they wanted to push out into the suburbs. And they came out to Brookline and said, we want to purchase land out here so that we can build tracks up along Beacon Street. Who owns all this land out here? And Henry Whitney raised his hand and said, well, I do. And so Henry Whitney overnight sort of struck a deal with the town of Brookline and with these streetcar companies. He sold back a big chunk of his land so that they could build tracks out into Brookline and carry people out there and sort of ease some of the congestion in downtown Boston. Henry Whitney then did two things. He went before the state legislature in Boston and he said, I have two proposals for you. Number one, those seven different streetcar companies that you now have that are complete and utter chaos in your city. If you wanted a, a carriage in Boston, you raised your hand, seven different cars might race for you, knocking people over, charging all different sort of fares, no regulation, no order whatsoever. It was a mess. He said, I will take those seven companies and I will consolidate them into one company and I will bring order to your chaos. One streamlined operation with regulated fares and assigned routes. Everybody will know where they're going, how they're gonna get there, how much it's gonna cost. That's number one. And number two, I will build you a tunnel under Boston Common, right under the city, I'll build you a tunnel. No one had ever uttered those words before, a tunnel under Boston Common. It was a big deal. The state legislature listened to those two ideas and said, Mr. Whitney, you've got a deal. And overnight, overnight, Henry Whitney, reminder, slacker, never went to college, dropped out of school, no career to speak of whatsoever, other than he bought some land and got rich. Overnight, Henry Whitney became the owner of the world's largest streetcar company. 8,000 horses, 4,000 employees, 200 miles of track just like that. 
So Henry Whitney now owns this big company called the West End Street Railway Company. That's what he names it. And he immediately sets out to improve it. The first thing he recognizes is these horses, they got to go. Horses, that's not the future. There's got to be something better to move transit, to move people around. Cities were starting to experiment with cable cars. The cable car in San Francisco had been successful. It worked, sort of. Cable car had a lot of problems, too. Cables snapped, they broke, they got twisted. It was expensive to operate. But it was better than the horse for a lot of people. But Henry Whitney wasn't convinced about the cable car. And one of the reasons why is that the cable car works well in cities with long and straight boulevards, but it's not great for a city with a lot of twists and turns and narrow roads. So New York, at some point, would actually experiment with the cable car. It made sense for New York, but in Boston, it made no sense. So he goes looking for something else. And what, of course, does he find? He hears about some guy, interesting engineer, inventor, smart gentleman, down in Richmond, Virginia, who's electrified the trolley system down there. And Frank Sprague has gotten wind of Henry Whitney up in Boston. And the two of them connect. Frank Sprague invites Henry Whitney to come down to Richmond and says, I have something to show you. Henry Whitney gets on a train with some bankers and financiers and other people, and they go down to Richmond. And on a July night in 1888, a big moment happens. Henry Whitney is staying at his hotel room, the Exchange Hotel in Richmond, Virginia. There's a knock at his door at about midnight. It's a steamy night in Richmond. You can probably picture it. Dark, steamy. The city's fast asleep. It's midnight. Everyone's sleeping. And Henry Whitney's knock at his door, and he's told to come on out. We have something to show you. He's brought to the bottom of a very, very steep hill in Richmond, Court Street. And there, Frank Sprague has lined up 22 individual cars, each with their own motor, bottom of a steep hill. With the wave of a lantern in the air, he gives a signal, and those 22 streetcars start to climb that hill. And again, it's one of those moments in history you often wonder, well, what would have happened if those things didn't go up over that hill? What if they stopped halfway up, or they start rolling backwards? But that's not what happened, of course. Those 22 streetcars slowly but surely climbed and crested and disappeared over that hill. And in that moment, Henry Whitney turned to Sprague and essentially said, I've seen the future. It's the electric motor. Sprague signs a contract that he starts to work on electrifying the Boston trolley system. That's a big deal. It's a very big deal. That allowed a big city like Boston, and Boston was one of the biggest cities in the country then, to give Sprague the attention that he needed, that he wanted, that he craved, and it allowed Boston to take its transit system and to electrify it. So that moment was big because it allowed cities to start thinking about how it could better improve its trolley system and its carriage system and its urban transit. That was a pivotal moment in allowing cities to start thinking about underground. Henry Whitney would eventually get distracted and move on. He sort of never finished that tunnel that he said he would do. Other people would go on to build the Boston subway tunnel. Would start in 1895, would finish in 1897. When they opened it, it was the first subway in America, as I said. Small, it was only about two miles of tracks. But it worked, it was successful, and eventually they would expand it. And it was a big deal. But that was Boston. When New York would open its subway, in 1904, on October 27, 1904, just to give you an example of scale here, Boston opened two miles of track. New York opened 20 miles of tracks, okay? Much, much bigger project. 20 miles of track. The first route of the New York City subway started down City Hall, went up to the bottom of Central Park, veered left, and up the west side. It went up the west side. There was no tracks on the east side when the New York City subway opened at first. East siders we're skeptical of the New York City subway. Not sure we want this, not sure it's gonna work. We'll wait and see how it works on the west side. So the east side line would come later. The first route sort of mirrors what we now know as the A and C line, sort of that route essentially is what the first subway route was. So the New York subway, there was two key characters that I focus on on the New York side of the story. I'll talk briefly about them. Where am I on time here? Sorry, let me just look. I'm going to talk for about a few key characters in the New York story, and then I'm going to show you some pictures, and then I'll take your questions. My two favorite people in the New York story, one was an engineer, and one was a German immigrant. The engineer was William Parsons. 
So William Parsons was, of course, we know him today as the founder of Parsons Brinkerhoff. That's the name that has sort of lived on into today's world, the builder of many, many projects. In Boston, the Big Dig certainly has that name attached to it. Uh, but the New York City subway has that name attached to it. So William Parsons was this brilliant engineer, went to Columbia, and he was determined. If he wanted to leave a legacy for New York City, he wanted that legacy to be the New York City subway. It was something that he was really determined to build. At one point in the late 1890s, he is so frustrated with the politics of New York City, just convinced that this subway project is never going to happen. It's get bog every time it seems like it's close and something's about to get approved, it would get rejected or it would fail or something would stand in the way and it would never happen. He got so frustrated he left, took a boat to China to do a project in China with his family. Just left. He left his papers and all of his maps and routes and everything he had worked on for a decade with a brother. He told his brother, do not give this to anybody. If they decide they're going to build the New York City subway, call me. I'll come back. But do not hand these papers over to anybody. These are mine. He's in China when he gets a cable, a cablegram, told that finally New York has approved a subway. And he comes back. And he does go about starting to design and build the New York City subway. One of my favorite anecdotes from the book was in 1891. One of the things William Parsons had to do that made him so uh, sort of revered in New York City is he had to learn the topography of the island. Remember, we're on an island. Building the New York City subway is building it on a rock. He had to learn the topography. So he went out with an army of workers on a summer day in 1891. And they went out with these devices that would puncture holes into the ground. And they could pull a soil sample out from the ground to determine how deep sort of the rock went, and where was the soil, and to determine the topography of Manhattan. They did this all over the city. And what it taught him and what he learned from it was that there were some parts of the city where, for example, he could puncture a hole down there that would go 60 feet before he'd hit something. But then in other parts of the city, Canal Street, for example, he might only go four feet down. That would explain much later why the New York City subway is built the way it is. Of course, there are some parts of the subway, as we all know, uh, Washington Heights and up there, where you take an elevator down to ride the subway. Well, that's because that was the only way the tunnel could be built down there. You had to dig deep. Other parts of the subway are right below our feet. We're walking down the sidewalk, we can see it. It's right there. That's because the subway could sort of go much closer to the surface there. So some parts of the New York subway he built with what's called the cut and cover method. Essentially, it's exactly what it sounds like. Cut a trench in the road, lay the tracks, seal the tunnel, cover it over. Boom, tunnel. Other parts of the subway had to be bored through the ground with a tunneling machine. And that's where things in New York got tricky and got dangerous. Dynamite, back then, was a relatively new invention. It was invented in the 1860s, 1870s, perfected, but not really harnessed. The power of dynamite was never really harnessed until much later. An example of sort of how naive the New York City subway workers were about dynamite they used a lot of it on the subway project. It was stored in a shed, a wooden shed, in the middle of the city on Park Ave that was lit by a candle. OK, that's how this shed was lit. And that didn't work out well. One day, the worker who was inside that shed, a gentleman by the name of Moses Epps, comes running out of the shed in the middle of the day screaming, run for your life. Everybody sort of looked crazy. This black gentleman comes running out of a shed, screaming, run for your life. Like, why run for our life? Well, it turns out that inside that shed, a candle that had been lit had fallen onto the floor, caught on a piece of paper, and was about to go boom. And sure enough, as everybody fled, that little shed exploded. It was a big explosion. But that's just an example of how people back then and workers back then sort of didn't understand dynamite and the power of dynamite. There was an accident that happened up in uh, the 180s, in 1903, so about three years into the building of the subway project. Again, here's another example of how naive the workers were about dynamite. 
So they, the way it would work is they would set off an explosion underground, and then they would wait 10 minutes or so, and then they'd go underground. And underground, they would sort of go back to work. Well, 10 minutes, as you can imagine, is not a very long time to wait after you've just done a dynamite blast underground. So they would wait 10 minutes and they'd go underground, but what they couldn't see and what they didn't know is that some of the rocks above them had cracks in them, had fissures in them, you know, and were perilously perched up above them. And sure enough, what happened in 1903, the workers, as they started to file back into the tunnel after setting off a dynamite explosion, a huge boulder collapsed, fell down on top of them. About a dozen workers were killed. It was a real tragedy. There was one of the sadder stories in the book is a story of a little boy named Timothy Sullivan, who stood at the entrance to the tunnel and waited for his father to be carried out. He knew he was down there, waited all night, and uh, his father had been killed in the accident. And he stood there and they brought his father's body up. A police officer put his arm around the little boy and said, you know, it's going to be okay, son. The boy got into the ambulance and rode away with his father. It was a tragedy, it was a real tragedy. William Parsons, the engineer who had designed and built the subway, showed up at the accident site the next day and went down into the tunnel. And when he emerged, his hands were covered in blood because the rocks had been covered in blood. And it was really an ugly scene down there. He emerged sort of stone-faced and just sort of grim. But William Parsons, if he was nothing else, he was determined and he was a businessman and he was determined to make sure this project did not get delayed. He was very stoic when he came out of the tunnel, out of the project, and he said, no one could have foreseen this happening, it was a horrible accident, but we must continue. And they did. And they continued, and the subway opened on October 27th, 1904. One big difference between the Boston subway and the New York subway, when Boston opened its subway, they opened it at 6 a.m. 6 a.m., the subway car came down Boylston Street in Boston, there were you know, a few hundred people waiting there watching the subway car and it stopped. There was no speech, no big celebration. People just sort of excited for the first subway car and then it just disappeared underground. That was it. Here we are, we built the subway, go ride it. That was Boston. New Yorkers like to celebrate. The New York subway on October 27th, 1904 didn't open until 7 p.m. The entire day was a day of celebration. Ferry boats in the harbor blowing their whistles, parades, speeches, everyone gave a speech. The first person to drive the Boston subway car was a guy named Jimmy Reed. He was a, sub he was a subway operator, he was a trolley operator for 30 years. He was a veteran trolley operator. He was given the privilege of driving the first subway car in Boston. The first subway car in New York City, driven by the mayor, Mayor McClellan at the time. So I thought what I would do is I'm going to read you just a very short passage from that sort of historic day in New York, and then I will show you my pictures, and then I will take some questions. So this is October 27th, 1904. Short passage. Outside City Hall, a sea of more than 5,000 people covered the steps, filled the plaza, and surrounded the kiosk of the City Hall station. It was almost 2.30 in the afternoon, when a procession of men in tall silk top hats and long black frocks came bounding down the steps. As Frank Headley, the subway's general manager, led the group toward the city hall kiosk, they were greeted by cheers and applause that drowned out the tooting factory whistles and the horns of ferries and tugs from the nearby harbor. Headley opened the station door and the group, with McClellan still holding the mahogany case, descended to the platform. A shiny silver subway train with eight cars attached sat there, and in seconds it was filled above capacity with officials, and a few dozen thrill-seeking stragglers who'd managed to sneak in behind them. In the front car, McClellan opened up the case to reveal a silver key, and Headley <coughs> took it and reached to slide it into a hole on the motor, only to be momentarily stymied. It doesn't fit very well, he said, but after tinkering for a few seconds, he succeeded, and with a sudden hissing noise, the electric motor buzzed to life. Headley leaned over to Mayor McClellan with some last-minute instructions. Are we ready, the mayor hollered. All right, Headley answered, keeping his hand on the emergency brake. Slow at first, remember? McClellan was a young, clean-shaven mayor with dark, wavy hair. He cut a dashing figure. A city alderman by the time he was 27, he was elected mayor over Seth Lowe in 1903 at the age of 38. His father had run against Abraham Lincoln for president and been a famous Civil War general. 
Though McClellan had no formal role in the subway's approval or construction, he was savvy enough to realize that his citizens were clamoring for it. And on his first day in office, he took a tour of the tunnels to show his interest and appreciation. Unlike his immediate predecessors, who were voted out of office in just a year or two, McClellan proved popular enough to last five years. And during his term, uh, his fondness for huge public works projects grew. He oversaw the construction of both the Queensboro and Manhattan bridges. For the subway, he merely benefited from arriving in office at the right time. And he made history as he pushed his right hand forward and began the first subway ride in New York's history. The car rounded, in a, corner, rounded a corner and the lights of the Brooklyn Bridge station came into view. Jerked to a stop without warning when the emergency brake was accidentally bumped, causing everyone on board to lurch forward. But the mayor got the hang of things and had the subway moving again in no time, picking up speed while Headley blew the train's whistle to warn track workers up ahead that they were coming. As they pulled into the Spring Street station, McClellan turned to Headley. Shall I slow her down here, he said, talking as if he'd been a motorman for his whole life. You're going slow enough, Headley answered, but aren't you tired of it now? Don't you want the real motorman to take hold? Like a boy playing with his new toy, the mayor shot back. No, sir, I'm running this train. And run it he did. Zooming up 14th Street and along 4th Avenue, which is now Park, McClellan pushed the train faster. His passengers behind him oblivious to how nervous he was making Headley. They passed idling trains that had not yet been allowed to start and flew by track workers, ticket takers, and guards, who all doffed their hats and cheered as the special train zoomed through. Into Grand Central they came, and then it was gone. A minute later, the passengers spotted a large electric sign, four feet high, 12 feet long, with a single word glowing, Times. McClellan shout out, shouted out, Times Square Station, but instead of slowing, he pushed the subway harder, faster, up to 43 miles per hour, far faster than Headley wanted to go on what was supposed to be a leisurely trip. Up the west side, they went past 66th where Headley turned to McClellan with a plea, slower here, slower, easy on the curve. They passed a worker who neatly sidestepped the train when he saw it coming, and then glided toward the last express station at 96th Street, where it slid over a switch in the ground onto the northbound local track. 19 minutes the trip lasted, about five minutes longer than the express ride from the Brooklyn Bridge to 96 would normally take under the control of a professional, but impressive nonetheless. It was finally after 96 when McClellan finally took his hand off the control and let the motorman on board, George Morrison, take over. McClellan, taking out a cigar that he quickly lit, puffed it and shook his tired wrist. Well, that was a little tiresome, don't you know, he said. You have to keep pressing that thing down the whole time. And if you relax your hand a little bit, the train will stop. With Morrison at the controls, the train continued north until without warning, the passengers who had been staring at darkened tunnels were suddenly looking out into the dusk. North of 122nd Street, the subway train emerged from the ground onto a viaduct that crossed into Manhattan Valley. It was the only place where it ran into the open air, and New Yorkers who knew of this precise spot came out to cheer it on, shouting from the streets and rooftops. Morrison blew the train's whistle before it disappeared back out of sight of the 135th. By evening, the crowds were on the verge of bursting through the doors. A slogan that had been shouted out for years and written in big headlines at one point or another by nearly every newspaper in the city began to be chanted in all seriousness, as it was now possible. Fifteen minutes to Harlem, the cries rang out. Most of the men held nickels in their hands, waiting for trains, while the women who'd lined up had five pennies, ready to hand over their coins in return for a green ticket. In the next five hours, 111,881 passengers would pay to ride the subway, and it seemed like every last one of them was standing outside a station somewhere across the city. The biggest crowds gathered at the express stations from Brooklyn Bridge Stop to Grand Central to Times Square, where more than 300 people filled the sidewalks and poured into the street. On the platforms underground, the ticket sellers braced themselves, worried about being unable to collect their fares, terrified of being crushed. Every New York police officer was on duty, sent out to protect the doors of the kiosks and stairways until permission to open them was received. It looked like a riot, but it felt like a carnival, since the pushing and shoving was of the friendly variety, and anyone who had a hand, hand free blew a whistle to keep up the party atmosphere. A few minutes before 7 o'clock on the evening of October 27, 1904, the familiar ringing sound echoed under the streets of New York. It was first heard in the uptown stations, and then quickly it began to be heard downtown. Alexander Graham Bell's telephone, 30 years after its invention, was now as much a part of everyday life in New York City as the subway was destined to become. Telephones had been placed inside the stations to allow for the different managers to call each other and for emergency calls to be placed in the event a train had to be stopped. The ringing at this hour lasted only a few seconds, however. 
for when the station manager of the station managers of the transit company answered the calls at their different posts across the city they were all greeted with the same three word message let him in that's it so i can't see the screen here oh i guess i can see the screen here. okay so just briefly here, and then I'm going to let you talk. The early days of tunneling, as I talked about, were dug, the early days of tunneling, the earliest tunnels were dug by slaves using their bare hands, rocks. They would light a fire. I thought this was fascinating. They would light a fire to heat the rock and then throw cold water on it to chip away at it. There were no tools back then to dig. That's how they did it. Not surprisingly, when this happened, the fire underground would suck up all the oxygen, and the slaves and the other workers who were underground would die of breathing in this horrible air. But that was how tunneling began. In 1841, where am I? There we go. Uh, in 1841, that Thames Tunnel opened in London. I mentioned that. There's an illustration of it. it was that man, Mark Isambard Brunel, was the brilliant London engineer who designed the London Underground. He and his father actually worked on it together. And he was uh, sort of the key player in the London Underground taking shape and being built in 1863. London's tunneling shield digs the world's first subway. There's a picture of it showing the workers inside the London Underground. 1869, Alfred Beach builds his secret subway right under Boss Tweed's nose. So there's an illustration of sort of what his cylindrical car sort of looked like. I didn't talk about this, but I have a whole chapter in the book devoted to the blizzard of 1888. The blizzard of 1888 was, if you think this past winter was bad, although New Yorkers, man, you guys got nothing compared to what we got up in Boston. <laughs> Holy cow. Our winter was really bad this winter. Um, the blizzard of 1888 was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. Crippled the entire Northeast. Mountains of snow everywhere. And it forced cities to sort of re-examine street transit and think about moving transit underground because it just couldn't work on the streets. 1895, Boston breaks ground on America's first subway. There's a picture. That's downtown Boston. For those of you who know Boston, built right along Tremont Street, where Emerson College is, right there downtown off of Boston. What's that? That's the Park Street Church, correct. Park Street Church, um, Tremont Street, right in the corner there is sort of Boston Common and the Public Garden. That's sort of where that is. March 4th, 1897, I told you about one of the New York tragedies. One of the Boston tragedies was a deadly gas line explosion. There was a horrible, horrible explosion that happened uh, on the streets of New York right above the subway tunnel before it opened. Um, a gas line, a leak, a subway car, a trolley, I should say, riding over it, sparks that came out, two cars blown 50 feet into the air. September 1st, 1897, Boston subway opens. Here's Parsons. He's a great man, one of the great men in sort of New York City history. 1900, New York breaks ground after a decade of debate. That's how they broke ground. I love that picture. Just guys walked out in the street with these giant picks and just started cracking the subway up, cracking the street up. That's how it started. The cut and cover method was used, but also deep tunneling was required. So the tunneling shields, Born through the ground, but that's one picture looking underground. There's another one. It's a great picture. The subway takes four years. The use of dynamite leads to lots of deaths and destruction, but it was really necessary. There was an accident that almost killed Parsons. He was underground inspecting the subway tunnel at one point. He was with a gentleman by the name of Major Ira Shaler. Iris Shaler was one of the lead subcontractors on the subway project. He was nicknamed Voodoo Shaler because he thought, everyone thought he brought bad luck to the project because wherever he worked, something bad happened. <laughs> sure enough, he's underground showing Parsons the subway project not far from here, Murray Hill. And at one point, they're looking at the work above, and Shaler takes his cane, poked a rock up above to show Parsons how it wasn't dangerous. Guess what? That rock collapsed on Iris Shaler killed him. Parsons was able to escape. And they were very close friends. It was a really horrible tragedy. But 
Shaler did not survive. He broke his back, was rushed to the hospital, and died a few days later. So Parsons almost died in that. Tunneling shield, critical to moving the project along. Shows sort of one picture there. And October 27, 1904, New York subway opens. As I said, sort of a big celebration, a grand celebration. There aren't a lot of great pictures. I, did, I searched high and low. I have a few, but there were not. What's that? City Hall, oh, that, that is City Hall, yes. Um, there's a few pictures from that first day, but not as many as I always wished. And 110 years later, New York is still digging subways, bigger and better. I got to take this tour a couple weeks ago of the East Side Access Project, which is being built along with the 2nd Avenue Subway Project. Um, I got to go underground and see it. It was a lot of fun to sort of go underground and see how the technology has changed and what it's like. So that was a couple of pictures I was able to snap while I was down there. There's another one. That's it. She said, she said, a personal story, then I'm going to take it So, uh, four years ago, uh, my wife was here with me tonight. We were uh, in New York City, um, and we were on the Upper West Side, Seven Times, which is near where I used to live. And we were with our two kids. At the time, our kids were maybe five and three. And we're going to ride the subway. As you can imagine, for kids riding the subway, it's, it's like going to Six Flags. It's like a giant, you know, carnival ride. So we go down the stairs to the 79 Street Station. We're waiting for the train. The kids sort of run up to the yellow line and look down the tracks and come back to us. And run the line. Okay, you okay? So, um, so my kids sort of running up to this yellow line, uh, staring down the track and waiting for the number one train to come. And then they come back to us and run out and run back. And they like five times, giggling and laughing. And finally, I took out my phone and they snapped a little picture of them. And they have that picture framed on our wall at home. And it basically just shows these two sort of wide-eyed kids, literally like this, staring down the track. And I love that picture because I like to think that the sort of excitement and the anticipation that they were in on that day had to be similar in some regard to the excitement and the anticipation that New Yorkers must have felt on October 27, 1904, at Bostonian, September 1, 1897. They're getting on a train underground. It's going to go through this dark tunnel, take them someplace, mysterious. What's it going to be like? That was what it felt like for my kids, and that's probably what it felt like for people back then. So I'd like to tell this story just because that picture sort of resonated with me. It's what I hope it must have been like back then. So I'll take some questions. We'll go there, and then we'll move here, and we'll move around. Go ahead and back. You mentioned uh, an immigrant, I think, along with Parsons. You said there was an immigrant also. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. I didn't get to that. So the immigrant um, was William Steinmeier. William Steinmeier, the name Steinmeier, sounds familiar? Steinmeier, the yeah. manufacturer. He came over and he became the chairman of the New York Transit Commission. He was a key, key player in getting the New York subway approved. He was the chief of the New York Transit Commission. He and Parsons worked hand in hand in getting the subway project designed and built. Um, Parsons was sort of a, a really a key character in the book. He's probably also the, uh, of all the anchors in the book, um, one of my favorites, one paragraph. Um, the day before a big boat came, New Yorkers were going to, uh, uh, New York co contractors were going to bid on whether or not uh, to build a subway and what the cost was going to be. The day before, the night before that happened, Steinway was nervous, was not, was not confident of how this whole process was going to go. That night, he went to bed, he came home from work, at 10 o'clock at night, he sent his workers home, his, his staff home, um, he had a pilsner. And he went to bed, as I write in the book, dreaming of burglars breaking into his house. I love that story. The reason I love telling that story is because I hope people read it and they ask themselves, how the hell does he know? So William Steinway was dreaming in 1891. 
reason I report to him is to know that. And Steinway was a good man who knew behind a detailed diary of his life. And he left that diary, which is now in the hands of the Smithsonian Institution. And they've digitized it. It's everything. You can look it up yourself. And there's an entry in there, sure enough, where he describes that night, which he talks about dreaming of burglary and breaking into his house. So I love that story. It just shows you how you get it. With research, you can get into people's heads 100, 150 years ago. So that was the character. Just the 
cities that were forcing people to live further and further out. They had to keep moving. They couldn't fit into the tiny area. So that's why, as I said, those transit operators, the companies that ran the transit companies, needed to go further out. So that was what. tracks where the people were migrating to. So if people were moving out to Jamaica Plain and Beacon and Bright. But yeah, but Jamaica Plain is part of Boston. Yeah, yeah, but, but it wasn't a very popular neighborhood. Though. So they were moving further out. People were moving out there and more people moved to Brookline. So the tracks were sort of going where the people were going. I mean, did Brookline pay for it? Oh, did Brookline pay for it? Yes, Brookline paid for it. Tracks, and that's how it originally came. Oh, that's it. Uh, the second thing you saw Express tracks in addition to local. That was um, Parsons' gift to the city. Parsons sort of designed this idea that we should have two tracks, you know, that parallel each other. And some of them are going to make all these local stops. And some of them are going to make express trains are going to keep going, and they will sometimes rise above and go below each other if necessary. But that was sort of his just design that he created. So it was really his gift to the city. Right. <coughs> True. Yeah. Until your talk tonight, I had not heard about William Whitney and his relationship to right. New York subway. But I have heard a lot about one person you didn't mention, August Belmont. He's a big player in the book because he financed the subway. What was their read? What did they have? What was Whitney's relationship to the project? And did he have any relationship to, to Belmont and Parsons? So Whitney had a big relationship to the project. Um, he was the guy who came to New York. Wayne Whitney did his whole biography, but he was um, a huge political player for a number of years. Wayne Whitney, in 1884, befriended a little known mayor of Buffalo, New York, uh, by the name of Grover Cleveland. And Grover Cleveland would then run for governor with Whitney's help, and then would then run for president with Whitney's help. And Whitney essentially got Grover Cleveland elected president. And he became Secretary of the Navy under Grover Cleveland. He then came back to New York after Grover Cleveland uh, was out of office got deeply involved with the New York transit system and essentially followed what his brother was doing up in Boston, sort of became the king of New York transit. His biographer, when he was the biographer, way in the 1940s, there's a whole chapter of the called the Empire, uh, His Empire on Wheels. It's about what he sort of involved in the transit system. He was very close with Belmont, they had a very close friendship. Um, in fact, years later, after he um, <coughs> died, um, a sort of a big secret came out by Belmont, where he revealed what Whitney's true role in the subway was. It was much deeper and more involved than anybody ever knew how involved he was in the creation of the subway. So their relationship was very close. They had a, a tight relationship. Yeah. The seven train only has two tracks going under the river. Okay. I agree. The result is if somebody gets sick or the train breaks down, the whole system upset. Got it. Because there's no way to no other alternative. That was the right way to tell That was the right way to tell That makes sense. Why didn't they allow, uh, you know, for emergencies? I mean, yeah, I don't know. It was Sandy Tunnel, it was a big tunnel, but I don't know the history of it. Was it was a light rail tunnel. And they, he never got a chance to operate it, but to do it, but eventually they incorporated it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know that. Oh, sorry. Let me just try to move around. to deliver a report to them and tell them, here's what we did, here's how it worked, here's what didn't work. 
they paid very close attention to each other. Um, it was a friendly competition. When William Whitney needed an engineer to build him a, a power station, he called Henry Whitney. He said, do you know someone who can do this? And Henry Whitney gave him his engineer. So they sort of worked with each other, played with each other. I will say that when Boston Subway opened, an article that appeared in the New York Times that you could read the end of that article with a line in the editorial that said that so conservative American cities such as Boston should build the first subway in America. You could sort of you could sort of feel the uh, not happening, but nonetheless. Yeah. So you guys got it. Uh, yeah. Elevated, it worked, but people really didn't like it. And, you know, eventually, 